Today I'm going to make a case to you why I believe capitalism is by far the most effective form of economy in the world. Not perfect, but the most effective economy in the world. A lot of you have been asking me about my opinions on capitalism, socialism, communism. I put 45 pages of notes you don't see over here right in front of me that I've typed out over the years. And I said, let's just make one video that if you can watch one video with your friends, peers, and sit there and debate it and say, I agree, I disagree, I don't like what he says, I want to get Mary's advice on this because you know Mary's not going to like what this guy's saying. You know what, I think John's going to like what he's saying. Let's see what John says about this. I want my professor to give his opinion on this. I want you to share with the people that you value their opinion and watch and sit there together and say, does this make sense and do you disagree? I disagree. Show me proof. Maybe I am wrong. I don't think he's right. He's absolutely wrong about this case here. Go make that argument for yourself and then comment below because I want to see those kinds of things. Here's, here's why I'm doing this. Here's why I'm doing this. I think a friendly debate for us to sit here and have and, and here's one of the reasons why I do something like this is the following reason. Obviously, Value Tamin is a channel purely based on entrepreneurship, and we do some cool interviews. But if you go on YouTube and type in entrepreneur, Value Tamin comes up all over the place. The purpose is to produce other entrepreneurs that create commerce for themselves, and they make money so you're no longer relying on a government to help take care of you or a corporation to take care of you. But this is even a bigger point. If I go to college today, for every one teacher that is gonna support capitalism in school universities today, professors, for every one teacher, one teacher that supports capitalism, there are 12 that oppose it. Let me say it one more time. It's one against 12. So the people that believe in capitalism today are being bullied by those who don't. 12 to one is what the numbers are. So if you're a kid that's 16 years old or young adult between 18 to 24 and you're going to school right now, odds are out of your 13 professors, 12 of them are not gonna like capitalism, one is. So my encouragement for you to have a brain that's sharp, that's debating everything that's being fed to you, is you need an argument like this to go sit in your classroom and say, Professor, Professor Johnson, you know, Patrick Medivis said the following, what do you think about it? And let them get into it and have that conversation with them. So again, question, thoughts, comments, comment below. If you haven't subscribed, subscribe to the channel. And if you wanna join the notification squad, join the notification squad by clicking that alert. Let's get into it. So, there's a big heavyweight matchup between these two forms of economies. You got the socialism, communism side, and you got the capitalism side, right? Now the flag carrier for communism and socialism was a guy named Karl Marx. By the way, I'm not gonna do a whole episode about Karl Marx in this one, I may do one in the future, but go study Karl Marx, go study about the financial difficulties he had about his kids, about how he was as a parent, about his philosophies, who he was. Go study who he was as an individual. But he wrote a book called Communist Manifesto that became a Bible to a lot of people. And then Leon Trotsky, Fidel Castro, Lenin, Stalin, the book on this side. Another one could be The Revolution Betrayed. And then I recommend you also reading The Naked Communist by Cleon Scouse. And he was a 15-year CIA agent that wrote the intricacies of how the communists are thinking about imposing their beliefs on other nations. Now on the other side, on the capitalists, the flag carrier is Ayn Rand. I mean, picture this, Ayn Rand and Karl Marx today. If they debated today, there is not a stadium big enough for people who would want to go watch these two guys debate Karl Marx against Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand wrote many books. One of the books she wrote that got a lot of controversy was Atlas Shrugged. She also wrote Fountainhead. And she wrote a book that very few people have read, but it's excellent, it's called Capitalism. The Unknown Ideal. Then you have Adam Smith who wrote the book Wealth of Nations. Then Milton Friedman who, uh, you know, my recommendation to you after you're done watching this video, go type in Milton Friedman, Phil Donahue. Make a note on the side. You will need to take a lot of notes with this. Phil Donahue and, my, uh, and Milton Friedman and just watch that debate. By the way, Michael Moore, you know Michael Moore who wrote uh, the, the video he made about capitalism and they're all greedy and all this other stuff. The same Michael Moore that doesn't believe in capitalism that's not worth 50 million dollars. A 18-year-old Michael Moore debated Milton Friedman many years ago that you can watch on YouTube, and then Benjamin Franklin. So these, these are the left and the right for you to be thinking about. Now, I want to explain, Cap, I'm going to cover 20 plus different questions today. And the first one that I want to explain to you that will make a whole lot of sense, hopefully, on what this means. What is this whole concept of capitalism, socialism, communism? I don't understand it. Every time I ask, I get five different answers. First of all, I want you to be thinking about it in the following way. Instead of looking at these things as different isms, look at it simply as numbers and control. Meaning, on this side, 
it's a lot of force. On this side, it's a lot of choice. Come with me to the next side to show you exactly what I'm talking about. So to simplify this whole concepts of different forms of economy, we created a pendulum, which I call the forms of economy pendulum that simplifies the whole thing for you. By the way, for some of you that are visual, we're going to put this whole thing for PDF for you to be able to print, share with others, and kind of look at them, read through it again. So let me explain to you what this means. The first question anybody has to answer when it comes down to capitalism, socialism, communism, you know, Leninism, whatever you want to call it, is this. Out of the hundred dollars that you make this month or this week or today or in the last two hours, how much of this hundred dollars are you willing to give to the government in exchange for certain services? What percentage? 30%, 40%, 50%? What percentage is it? Based on what percentage you're willing to pay, that's the form of economy you believe in. Let me simplify it for you. If you say a hundred percent, which is not many people, If you give 100% back to the government, that means you believe in communism, which means the government gives everything for you. They make all of your decisions in your life, and you go to work, you wake up in the morning, you go to work, no matter how hard you work today, no matter how many books you read today, no matter how much you personally develop yourself, you're not going to get paid because the government gives you your food, milk, drink, juice, place to stay, transportation, all of that stuff. That's it. On the complete opposite end, if it's 0% tax, you say, I don't want to pay any taxes. Well, listen, if you don't want to pay any taxes, you have an anarchy. You know what happens when there's an anarchy? Here's what happens. No rules, no regulations, no laws. You're not protected. You can be living in a house with your wife and kids. Somebody else can come with a gun. They're stronger than you. They can kill you, take your wife, take your kids, and they're not going to prison. There are no laws. He's not getting arrested. Cops are not coming. Nothing's going to happen. Your house is on fire. No one's going to come and take care of that place because there's not a service to do it. It's 0% anarchy. The last time we had an anarchy, I think it was in... It's Somalia from 1991 to 2006, and prior to that, I want to say it was Albania when we had an anarchy, right, that took place. But years ago, there was anarchy, many, many years ago. Today, this is the pendulum of the extreme, far left, far right. Now, capitalism is when you say, you know what, I'm willing to give 10 to 35 percent. Some people say, I want to pay 10 percent flat tax, which means you make 100 grand a year, $10,000. $10,000. You make a million dollars a year, you're paying $100,000 in taxes. You make $50,000 a year, you're paying $5,000 in taxes. But between roughly 10% to 35% is considered taxes. That money is it's considered capitalism. That money goes to the government. The government gives you the basic service of what you're looking for. We're talking security, which means a military, some police, the fire department, you have roads, you have education. You have some of those things that's being taken care of right that, uh, like that for you. Now, In the middle here is when there is a major mixture of capitalism and even more socialism issues. This is when you kind of mix the two up. So this is when you're at 35 to 50% in taxes, where it goes a little bit deeper. Somebody said, well, I think we need to have free healthcare, free this, free that. And then when you pass the tipping point of 50%, this is when you're at socialism, 50% plus. This is the conversation. Well, I think we need to have free food. I think we need to have free college. I think we need to have free pension. I think we need to have free, like a Bernie Sanders thing. And by the way, it works very well with the young audience because the 21-year-old, the 20-year-old that's in college right now, it's very easy to buy into the concept of free, free, free because rich people are greedy and they suck and they're horrible. Now, my name is Bernie Sanders. I own all these nice properties. I drive an R8, but all these other rich people are totally greedy, but I'm not. I'm the good guy, but these guys are terrible people, but it's an easy concept to sell. Very easy. Believe me, I lived in a, I lived in a country where 9 million people revolted. 9 million. It's bigger than the French Revolution. You can go read about it in Iran in 1979. February started from 77, December 31st, after Jimmy Carter put up the glass with the Shah of Iran. And he left, the moment he left, the revolution started and it dragged out. Cinema Rex fire in Iran at Abadan and all this other stuff. I'm born in October 18, 1978, at the peak of it, when I was born. There's a guy named Khomeini who got up and said, we have so much money, we can give you free food, we can give you free phone, we can give you free this. And everybody said, what a savior, what a noble concept. He got elected, right? So this is as simple as it can be explained. Now, someone would say, well, Pat, I think it's a little bit more technical than that. Let me explain to you. The same way this goes, private property. On this side, you don't have any private property because communism, they own your property, okay? Capitalism, you have private property. You can own property, you can own your business, you can own all that stuff. Here, 
socialism gets involved because then it becomes nationalized. They want health care to all go through the government. They want banks to go through the government. They like Hitler believed in socialism. He was a fascist, but he believed in socialism. All of that's going through the government. We control it. We control it. We control it. You do your loans through us. You do your this through us. You do your health care through us because it's all controlled. Regulation. This side, a ton of regulation. You can't even breathe. Here, capitalism, you need regulation. Why do you need regulation? If you don't have regulation, there could be a monopoly, kind of like there used to be a monopoly with AT&T or Microsoft. You cannot have a monopoly because then the small business owners being hurt, who runs a mom and pop shop and all this other stuff. So there needs to be some regulation. Too much slows down business. Too little, it's a doggy dog fight and no one can survive in an anarchy type of an environment. Right here, good amount of regulation, it's safe. Taxes, how much are you willing to pay? Speech. On this side, you have no freedom of speech. A lot of people live in China right now. Their forms of economy could be capitalism, which there's a lot of money to be made. But if it comes down to you voicing your opinion against the government, you do not have a freedom of speech because they're still running it. And a communist, I still have control over you on what you say. You can't get up and create a YouTube channel and bash the rulers and all this other stuff. You cannot do that because freedom of speech. Here, free. Here, controlled. Uh, Decision-making process. Here, somebody makes all your decisions for you. Here, you make the decisions for yourself, backed up by laws and regulations. Owning business. You own your business here, you don't own business here. Competition. There is no competition here, right? There's a lot of competition here, okay? Lots of competition here. What's a good thing about competition? If there's no competition, you literally, listen, you would not watch a single movie if there was no competition. You, you would not watch a single sporting event if there was no competition. We love competition, except we hate to lose. You and I, we love watching other people win or lose. We just hate it when we're the one that's losing. We love watching sports center and saying, did you see how bad that one? I was so embarrassing. What a stupid, I cannot believe he got knocked out. That, blah, blah, blah. And then Twitter, ta, 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 ta. But except when we lose, we don't like it, right? We need competition. We love competition. We, we, we admire competitors for having the courage to compete and lose. But so many people don't like it. And last but not least, inheritance. On here, no inheritance. Socialists, you know, on this side, you know, they don't like to, you know, have a rich person. When he dies, his money goes to his kids. They say, that's not fair. That money should go to the government. It needs to go to the government because the go- this kid's a spoiled brat. I cannot believe he's willing to take this money from his parents. And, you know, when he dies, why should that $22 million go? We should tax all of it, right? This is what they say. Now, let me give you on the contrary. The same people, the same people, liberals, whatever you want to call them, that want to tax 100% of all the wealthiest inheritance. Let me explain in a different way that hopefully this will make sense to you. Think about this generation today is using the money of the prior generation and the prior generation that they made. Let me explain. America gets started 1776. Then all of a sudden you have the Rockefellers, Carnegie's, JP Morgan Chase, all these guys come up and they start creating commerce and businesses and then 80s and then 90s and the market's getting bigger. And, and government's bigger, our, our GDP is bigger, we got all this money coming in. And then people say, well, now that we're rich, we should use the government's money to go out and come out with free health care and free college because we can afford it. The same thing that they don't like with inheritance is the same thing they like to do that inherited the prior generation's tax dollars to put to use. Lots of contradictions there to understand this part. Now, prior to me going and answering the next question, I want to kind of show you the following because a lot of times you'll hear people say, well, you know, there's so many people that capitalism's hurt and and if there was a right noble leader in communism or socialism, this country would be so amazing if there was somebody that's ran noble because communism, if you think about it, there's a part of it you say, well, it's kind of noble, you know, it's kind of cool because what's the purpose of me having everything? I should give everything away because it's not mine anyways. If there was this beautiful noble leader that came from the skies, and it was so beautiful and amazing and loving and caring, and he wasn't driven by power or selfish desires, we would have the most amazing country in the world. Well, let me tell you what happened when we have these noble leaders that all of a sudden realize they have so much power. Look at the decisions they end up making. Now, before we go hire this major recruiting company, find this incredible noble leader for us that's going to run this country based on a socialistic and communistic philosophy. Let me give you some historical events and leaders on how many people were killed because of this leader or this event. And by the way, remember this, one life is way too many lives lost. Think about how many people in your life 
have died and imagine that feeling, that loss and take it at the numbers that we have here. Let me show you the first one here. The first one is the Hiroshima atomic bombing. 70,000 lives were lost. This is 70,000 too many. Here's another one. The Armenian genocide that was done by the Turkish regime back in 1915, 1 1.5 million lives. Let me see again, 1.5 million lives were lost. 1.5 million. You can watch the movie Promise by Christian Bale and Oscar Isaac. With Christian Bale and Oscar Isaac, you'll see how emotional and tragic these events are. The same time when Turkish regime did that to the Armenians, they also did it to the Greeks. 750,000 lives lost, and the Assyrians lost 300,000 people. That's over 2.5 million lives lost, and that's still not the highest. When you think about slavery, if you've seen the movie Rosewood with John Voight, or if you've seen the movie 12 Years as a Slave, I watched that movie three times in the first week that came out. Or if you've seen Glory by Denzel Washington and Morgan Freeman, you see and feel what many of these slaves experienced during those years. And roughly, it's been said that 1.5 million at a low to 5 million lives were lost due to slavery. Here's another one that many, many movies have been made about. You know, know this, you've read about this, the Holocaust. Hitler and the Nazis. 25 million people were killed. Hitler believed in socialism. 25 million people were killed. If you've seen the movie Schindler's List with Liam Neeson, or if you've seen the movie The Pianist by Adrian Brody, you can actually get a feel what they experienced. Now, as, as tragic this is, as, as terrible as this is, with the amount of people that were killed during these events, let me show you what communism did. Here's communism for you. It's been estimated between 80 to 94 million people. Let me say it again, 80 million to 94 million people were killed by a communistic regime and a communistic leader. Here's some number for you. Number one, Mao Zedong from China who was a communist, 45 million to 75 million. Stalin from Russia, 40 million to 62 million. Lenin from Russia, 4 million. Pol Pot, Cambodia, communist, 1.7 million to 2.4 million. Ho Chi Minh from North Vietnam, also communist, 1.7 million. Kim Second Sung from North Korea, communist, 1.6 million. Ethiopia, 1.7 million. Afghanistan, 1.5 million. South America, I can give you a lot of different ones on how many people were, lives were lost at these events. Look, here's what to realize. You know, somebody was asked, we were having a debate over term limits, okay? It was actually at the home office by somebody who was a Republican who wanted to have more term limits. And I said, you know why I'm not comfortable with having people be a, a president or senator or congressman for 20, 30, 40 years? I'm not comfortable with that. Why? Because you eventually get so much power that you think you're bigger than everybody else and you can go and cross the line when all of a sudden somebody comes in that is only driven by power that can abuse that power. This is why it's good to have a president be two terms max and no longer than two terms because whether you like him or not, two terms later in eight years, you're going to have somebody else that's typically going to be the complete opposite. You have Reagan, then you have Bush Sr., then you have Clinton, then you have Bush, then you have Obama, then you have R R Trump. It's a pendulum. And we're, I'm not happy being, I'm not happy. And this is why, it's kind of like this. Our presidents show us like the eagles, right? We go, oh, too much to the left, too far to the right. The point here for you to realize is the following. Capitalism is simply a mathematical formula. So is communism, so is socialism. It's all a math formula. And when it comes down to the capitalism formula, it produces results. That's simple. Communism produces power, control, decision-making for you. Socialism forces you to give to something you don't want to give to. Capitalism says, listen, you give me 30% of your money, I'm gonna give you military safety, roads, all this other stuff, laws that somebody can abuse you, bully you, and all that other stuff. Go do what you want to do. That concept works. By the way, for some of you guys that are wondering politically, which way I lean, I voted left, Bill Clinton, I voted right. And today, I'm a registered independent. Do you know why? Here's why. They just showed a number on CNN this last week, and they said California used to be a majorly a, a democratic state. I think today California is 45.6% democratic, 25.4% republican, 25% independent. Both the democratic and the Republican vote in California is going lower and they're getting more independence. You know why? Because people are sick and tired of the games being played on both sides. Both sides, games are being played, both of them. And the reason why games are being played is because of the following reason. Let me explain to you. 
when you go in too deep into anything, if you go and hang out with gangsters or mobsters for a weekend, cool, you had fun. Two weekends, no problem. Three months, six months, 12 months later, you're kind of deep. Three years later and you make a commitment to go to a couple business transactions, you're in too deep already, you can't leave. This is what's happening to a lot of our political people. They're so in too deep on the left side or the right side that they can't come out and say, I'm wrong. And for you, as a young person or whoever you are that's watching this, my suggestion to do a recap of this today, you heard me talk about the heavyweight matchup and the, the forms of economy, the pendulum that I talked about. I want you to PDF, uh, download the PDF that I have on the bottom. Click on the link below to download the PDF. Go through it and study the notes. Share this, watch this video with other people and sit down and ask yourself, do you agree, do you not agree? What do you think about this? Go watch the videos on Phil Donahue with Milton Friedman. Go watch old interviews of Ayn Rand. You're not going to find interviews with Karl Marx, but there are other people you can see that make their arguments for communism or socialism. Break it down for yourself. This just makes no sense to me. I don't get, I don't agree with this guy. Create that own opinion and you'll see what, what it comes back down to. If you're an open-minded person, you're going to have a very hard time arguing capitalism. But the only thing we're really going to be arguing is, what percentage of your $100 should be taxed. So, with this capitalism series, expect many other videos to come. I have a lot of notes that I haven't covered yet. Many of them that I have not covered yet. And it'll be coming out here soon. Stay tuned for it. And I want to hear from you. If there's anything you want to tell me about, you can tweet me. I'll respond back if you send me a Twitter. My handle is Patrick Bed David. And if you got anything you want to comment on the bottom, comment, you know, whatever it is. Comment below as well. If you haven't subscribed to this channel, do so. And join the notification squad by clicking on the alert button. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.